noontide, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii on a beautiful Hawaiian summer day, February 14th, 2021. And a completely non controversial topic we have today is small nuclear appropriate for Hawaii. Our honored guest is going to say yes. And before anybody jumps up and says, it's illegal in Hawaii. No, it's not illegal. If two thirds of the Senate, two thirds of the House approve the concept of nuclear for Hawaii, discussion can begin. And if it's approved by the appropriate bodies, it will take place. Little bit of background on Hawaii's clean energy initiative and nuclear is clean energy. We were the first state in the nation to declare for 100% clean energy by the year 2045. Other states soon joined in, and I believe are up to 30 states or municipalities that have similar goals now, and we keep competing with one another to get more and more aggressive. Now, in addition to that, a major portion of our electricity currently comes from a coal burning plant out in Campbell Industrial Park. Guess what? The legislature says that it must close by August of this year. So no problem. We just put in more and more solar farms, right? We just get acreage and acreage and just blanket it with solar panels plus storage. No. Every time my colleague in the energy office makes an application for another solar farm or the company he's working with does, boom, no, it's supposed, can't do it here, can't do it here. And so our progress towards clean energy is slowing down. Now, there's nothing quick about nuclear energy. It's going to take a long time if it uh, bears fruit. But to help us on our way, is the Honorable Jessica Lovering, CE, no, the Executive Director of Good Energy Collective. And she joins us from uh, beautiful Santa Barbara, California. And what, welcome to the program, Miss Lovering. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And if you could first give us a little bit of background about Good Energy Collective, and then we can get into discussions about uh, what you did in Puerto Rico and, and, and so forth. Take yeah, so um, really quick summary of Good Energy Collective. Uh, Co-founded the organization just a little over a year ago, and the motivation was really we saw a lot of really exciting uh, momentum building around aggressive action on climate change. Uh, coming from particularly younger, um, progressive climate groups. Uh, and we were really excited about that, but um, we also weren't seeing sort of discussion or any mention of nuclear. Whereas in, um, at least in the, the federal government, uh, there's been a lot of bipartisan uh, support for nuclear for the last kind of five to 10 years. And we've seen a lot of, um, exciting stuff happening with new designs and innovation and new startups and entrepreneurs working in the nuclear space. Um, so we as uh, more progressive folks were interested in developing, researching and developing nuclear policy that really aligned with this broader uh, climate change agenda. And so that's why we found a good energy collective uh, is to help develop those sorts of policies. Mm. And just Beautiful. a caveat, you know, before we get into it too much, uh, we are a nonprofit. Um, we don't take any money from industry. We're interested. Our main sort of motivation is climate change and also environmental justice. So that's the framework that we're looking at these policies in. Well, you know, before we launch in, you raise a very good uh, point about climate change. And we have shifted our words from clean energy to decarbonization. Can you discuss first the relationship between nuclear energy and the road to decarbonization? Yeah, I mean, that actually might be answered by my first 
a couple of comments. So maybe uh, can I just get in get sure, into the sure, points sure, I was sure. going to make? Okay. It's, it's always yours. Uh, yeah. Because because there's definitely a strong connection. So um, I did want to kind of contrast really quick. So I'm based in California, and I know Hawaii has this 100% renewable portfolio standard with a target of 2045, um, and they're on track. That's great. Uh, but it's kind of been the easy stuff so far. Um, and the, the deeper penetration you get of renewables, the harder it gets. Um, and so I wanted to compare with um, what's going on in California, which is very similar in that, you know, Hawaii was really the leader, but California um, recently has instituted a 100% uh, zero carbon electricity goal by 2045. So similar goal, but um, California's is explicitly zero carbon technologies, whereas Hawaii is more focused on renewables. Um, in California, at least 60% needs to come from renewables, but the rest, the 40% can come from anything low carbon. Um, and so low carbon um, can include things like um, uh, natural gas with carbon capture, um, it can include large hydro and it can include nuclear. Um, and so that, that makes it a little bit different. Um, but why this is important and why it matters is that historically um, countries that have uh, done big decarbonizations or big reductions in their carbon emissions have relied on nuclear. Um, it's, uh, you know, renewables and sort of scalable renewables are much newer. Uh, but we haven't seen sort of a big decarbonization effort focused on renewables, even though there's a lot of targets and goals uh, in place right now. So um, to talk about why it's so challenging to do with just renewables, um, I wanted to focus on sort of, um, because California is bigger, um, there's been a lot more studies of um, California's grid and how to get to 100% zero carbon electricity by 2045, which seems far in the future, but could actually come up on us pretty close. Wow. So there was a, um, a big study commissioned by the Environmental Defense Fund and Clean Air Task Force. Um, and what they did is they had three different groups do the modeling independently and then compare the results. And that was Princeton, Stanford, and this group E3. Uh, and the big conclusion was that um, solar and wind can't do it by themselves. Uh, and the main reason is, is this intermittency or variability. So, you know, it's a cliche, but uh, the sun's not always shining, the wind's not always blowing, and that can be really challenging for a grid, even a very, um, you know, modernized smart grid. Um, now, grid scale storage, like batteries, uh, can really help, but they are more helpful on sort of the hourly intermittency basis. So they can kind of extend your energy into the evenings, maybe even overnight but they are, um, it's harder to do sort of day or week long variability with batteries. To handle those longer, vari uh, longer uh, variations, um, the models show you really need to have um, overbuild of your capacity uh, significantly. So in California, what this looks like is right now, um, California, our peak demand is about 50 gigawatts. Um, by 2050, it's going to look more like 100 gigawatts because we're electrifying transportation, we're going to be electrifying home heating and industry, because um, we're also trying to decarbonize outside of the power sector. Um, so peak demand is going to be 100 gigawatts. Um, and if we were to meet that with entirely solar wind, we'd need to build out at least 500 gigawatts of solar and capacity to be able to cover all those, those peaks. That's um, about <laughs> how much capacity there is uh, sort of peak capacity in the US as a whole. So um, that's a huge amount of power stations that you need to build in a, in a pretty short amount of time. Um, so the different models um, that did this uh, estimated that it would raise rates by at least 60%. Um, and it also just might not be realistic in that, um, you know, the amount of solar you need to deploy is about 10 times faster than we've ever deployed solar before. Are there enough workers? Are there enough panels? Are there enough minerals? Um, you know, a lot of these minerals um, we import, uh, a lot of panels we import too. Um, so there's a lot of challenges. It's not to say it's impossible and definitely innovations will help, but um, these models also found that if you include 
what they're calling clean firm power. Um, so that's, you know, dispatchable kind of on-demand base load power that's also low carbon, things like geothermal, natural gas carbon capture, or nuclear, that can actually lead to lower costs than today and also help support a deeper penetration of wind and solar. Um, so that's kind of a, a conclusion I want people to take home from this is that it's not nuclear versus renewables. It's that um, nuclear or geothermal large hydro can be a really good complement and actually help you deploy more wind and solar because it can be this low carbon uh, sort of backbone for the grid. Um, these studies did find that, you know, maybe even 50% of electricity could come from wind and solar with no problems, um, but you do need to have these, these sort of backup sources. Um, another challenge is that, um, and you, this, um, Howard mentioned this in the beginning, uh, renewables take up a lot of land and um, you might not think that's a big problem because, you know, we've got lots of space, you know, we've covered things with parking lots, um, you know, we can put things on rooftops, but um, the problem is that if something takes up a lot of land, it also means there's more chances for local opposition because more people see it, more people live next to it. And we are seeing that across the US, um, growing opposition from, from local groups um, against renewables projects. Uh, and the reason is that, you know, even though they're clean energy, a lot of people view these as big industrial infrastructure projects that are uh, blighting the landscape. Um, and they do have real impacts on the ecosystems. We see this a lot in California with desert ecosystems and, and threats to endanger, endangered species. Um, so for, for all of those reasons, um, there's a growing discourse around how to include um, nuclear in these deep decarbonization scenarios. And particularly what people are talking about is um, smaller nuclear, um, what are called small modular reactors. Okay, so what are those? <laughs> um, mm. How are they different? Uh, you know, the, the big thing, and this is in the name, is they're much smaller. So a typical nuclear power plant that operates in the US today is around a thousand megawatts. So one gigawatt is huge. Um, they cost billions of dollars, um, but they also provide a ton of electricity. So um, small modular reactors, typically more in the range of 50 to 300 megawatts, uh, so much smaller. And we're also now seeing um, what are called micro reactors starting licensing. And those can be anything under 10 megawatts. Um, and there's one that's going through licensing now that's 1.5 megawatts. So for those of you not in the electricity space, you don't know what these megawatts mean. Um, a, a large offshore wind turbine is about three megawatts. Um, so this is smaller than a single wind turbine in terms of power output. Although, unlike a wind turbine, a micro reactor is going to generate electricity 24-7 uh, every day of the year for decades. Um, so it's not just the smaller size, you know, it's cheaper because they're smaller, but there's big innovations in making something that's modular. It allows for factory fabrication, which could be huge in terms of reducing costs, but also um, you know, having a much better uh, understanding of timeline. You know, you order it like a mass produced product, you get it on a certain um, time scale. There's not this much uncertainty around um, uh, going over time. Um, but big question, which I know this is the topic of this is, are they safer? Uh, and so my first big caveat is that nuclear is already very safe. Um, it's much safer than fossil fuels in terms of public health and mining impacts but also on a life cycle basis. And if you include mining um, and contamination, nuclear has a similar safety record to renewables. But, you know, people are of course still worried about the safety from nuclear because we've seen these events like Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and, um, you know, people are worried. And so my um, second caveat is that we're not just gonna trust these companies building um, SMRs who say they're safer. The designs go through a very rigorous process to be licensed um, that includes looking at all sorts of, of worst case scenarios, really extreme events, and making sure the safety is managed. Um, but that being said, um, there are a bunch of innovations in the designs um, that could make accidents like the one at Fukushima pretty much impossible. Uh, and 
I won't go into the technical details because um, there's a lot I could say, but I did want to give just a couple like easy to grasp examples. So the main thing is that smaller designs um, can lead to radically simpler engineering. Um, so if something's simpler, it can be safer and also easier to sort of mass produce. So um, a lot of these designs rely on passive safety rather than active safety. Um, and what that means, I'm going to give you a concrete example. Um, so if a reactor gets too hot, uh, right now, you need to pump more cooling water through it. And that relies on these really big pumps that you also need to have, you know, backup pumps and redundant pumps in case something goes wrong. A lot of SMR designs rely on passive cooling which you can think of as if you're boiling stew in a pot, you know, the hot liquid rises to the top and when it cools, it drops back down. So relying on that natural process um, is much more reliable uh, and you don't need sort of complicated human intervention and, and engineering systems. Um, some designs don't rely on water as a coolant. Um, so it's very hard to have the coolant evaporate or go away. Um, there's different kinds of coolants and you even have air cooled designs. Um, so a few other points I wanted to mention on safety, uh, I'm going to try and, and, and wrap up pretty quick. So some designs, um, especially micro reactors are designed with lifetime cores. So what that means is the reactor comes to you fully fueled, uh, you plug it in, it generates electricity for kind of 10 to 30 years. And then the entire reactor is shipped back to a central processing facility for decommissioning. And what that means is that you don't have fuel handling and fuel storage on site. Um, so that reduces a lot of risks, especially for the local community that's hosting the plant. Um, now, uh, we did mention Puerto Rico um, several times. So there's, um, there's a group out of Puerto Rico called Nuclear Alternatives Project. Um, and they've gotten funding from Department of Energy to do a feasibility study. And their motivation was really coming out of 2017 um, Hurricane Maria. They had big failures in their power grid and they were looking for ways to make it more resilient by creating a web of microgrids. Uh, and they wanted to explore the option of having um, small modular reactors as a part of that. Um, and especially they have a lot of their fossil generation is gonna be shut down in sort of the next 10 years. Um, so the first phase of their study found that yes, small modular reactors are feasible for Puerto Rico, they make sense, and the next phase is looking at um, siting, so where would be good spots to put them in Puerto Rico. Um, and just a little bit in terms of siting and kind of status of SMRs, there's several going through licensing right now looking for demonstrations kind of in the next five years. Um, other options that, that could be particularly interesting for Hawaii are um, floating nuclear or, or offshore nuclear. Um, the U.S. has done that in the past. It makes intuitive sense for a lot of people. You know, we have nuclear aircraft carrier, nuclear submarines. Um, it reduces a lot of the challenges. Yeah, there's a great picture. Um, it reduces a lot of the challenges of siting because you don't have to worry about um, you know, earthquakes and flooding, uh, it's very sort of stable location. Um, and the reactors can also be built in shipyards, which that's a picture of um, sort of an artist rendering of that, um, which we have a lot of experience building big complex um, equipment in shipyards. Um, could also be sited on military bases. Um, that could help and sort of, um, those sites are very well characterized. They have good security. There's some bureaucracy challenges around selling electricity that can be challenging, um, but there's a separate program through Department of Energy right now and Department of Defense looking at developing SMRs specifically for military applications. Um, and so that's kind of a parallel track of innovation right now. So that's where I'm gonna stop um, and I'm happy to, to answer more questions. Okay, well, let, let me start. And thank you. That is very, very coherent description. Thank you very much, Jessica. So first, I want to introduce the concept of firm power. We all know, as you said, the sun rises and sets, the wind blows and then stops. From a utility standpoint, firm power means that you are delivering X number of megawatts 24 seven. And for many power stations, they have to shut them down once a year, once every couple of years to clean them up. I don't think that the nuclear plants have to do that. 
So this would be firm power for, I believe you said 10 to 15 years? Specifically, yeah. the some of the micro reactor designs have these really long lifetimes. Um, traditional nuclear power plants do need to shut down about every two years for refueling. Um, but with smaller designs, one of the benefits is that you can stagger those. So if you have, you know, a 10 or 50 megawatt uh, power plant, you can stagger when you're when you're doing those refuelings um, and plan for it rather than having sort of unplanned shutdowns. And you mentioned the largest small or small nuclear plant might be uh, 300 megawatts. Just for context, in Honolulu. We've gone down from about 1,200 to uh, 1,000 megawatts, and it seems to me like, and we're have, we're going to have trouble with uh, the meeting that demand because even though if we get more efficient and we get more solar down there, EVs, electric vehicles, are going to be coming on like gangbusters, and we have all these microgrid plans for them, but it's still going to raise the demand even while we're uh, lowering in other ways. So let's just say hypothetically, we stay at about 1000 megawatts demand. Seems to me like 300 megawatts firm power right under there so that all these renewables need to worry only about 700 megawatts. I think that makes life a whole lot easier for, for the renewables and a lot more reliable also. Yeah, and right now, a lot of places that have um, a lot of renewables and a lot of growth in renewables, um, like Hawaii, but also places like uh, Denmark and Germany, um, they have still a uh, big reserve of fossil capacity. So they've got oil plants or they've got coal plants that are serving as that backup. Um, and that's working really well right now. But as they look towards you know, full decarbonization of the power sector, uh, you need something else. And I think um, thinking about nuclear as a replacement for that fossil backup is, is sort of the best case for it. And, and we've done work specifically looking at coal to SMR repowering. Um, oftentimes, you, it's, it might even make sense to build at the same site because um, you've already got those power lines. You've already got sort of an industrial brownfield site. It might be easier um, to get approval for siting there. Um, you maybe have cooling water and things like that. So uh, that might be a really good option in terms of um, public acceptance and feasibility to site an SMR at, a, at an old fossil site. Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, one of our main industrial areas is a little unknown spot called Pearl Harbor. And you mentioned siting on right on the ocean because I'm assuming would the seawater become the, the operative coolant then? Uh, depends on the design, but um, water-cooled reactors, yes, being on the ocean would be probably preferable. Some of these newer designs don't use water as their coolant and don't use water for steam generation. So those could be inland, um, but depends, yeah, on the design. And as you and I were chatting about earlier, we know there would be uh, protests out there when we even start talking about this. But if we made an agreement with the military. And incidentally, here in Hawaii, we have lots of agreements with the military, including uh, power siting. There, there is a power plant on one of our uh, military bases here. So very possibly, hypothetically, 300 megawatts in Pearl Harbor and maybe on land. And in the event of a total shutdown where all the other power supplies are interrupted, there might be with nice high resolution grids, that plant powering the hospitals, the police, and so forth, the absolutely essential emergency services, plus powering the, uh, the military base. That, that could be a, a politically feasible so solution there. Yeah, a lot of places, including military bases, have um, a system of diesel generators for emergency supply in case, you know, the grid goes out, something to power your um, emergency response system. And more and more places are looking at doing microgrids to power their emergency services. And I think small modular reactors and micro reactors could be a good thing to have um, for resilience, for disaster response. 
Um, and the last thing I wanted to say was, you know, this is an extreme case, but if you have your whole grid goes grid go out, um, it's actually a little hard to restart the grid um, with renewables. Um, and so you need something uh, to turn the grid back on. Um, and this is called black star capability and nuclear can be good for that or fossil fuels can as well. So something to sort of get the, the momentum up um, back to that 60 Hertz. And now that you've got me thinking about the military, the military does have a rather uh, large budget. That is the one area that the blue states and the red states all agree on big military budget. So all the more argument for, for setting it on, on the uh, military basis here. So that, you know, there might be benefits to setting on military. I would, I would caveat that I would like to see costs come down. Uh, so they're competitive with grid power, no matter what. And also, even if it's easier to side on a military base, I would still think it's really important to get community consent um, and community support um, through a more genuine engagement process. That's something I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, everyone would be happier. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll bring you down as chief uh, testifier then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because we, we do get uh, re resistance here. And finally, oh, you mentioned that entrepreneurs are interested in uh, possibly backing ventures like this. We have, we've got about one minute left. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, there are over 60 companies in the U.S. working on advanced nuclear designs. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are venture funded. A lot of them are small startups. Um, so that's something very different than kind of the large incumbents like the Westinghouses of the world that were building nuclear before. Um, so just new companies, there are lots of entrepreneurs in this space and a lot of venture capital money going into it. So people see the promise. And finally, we have learned our lessons. Technology across the board is improving, 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 improving. And I would say, especially with regard to small nuclear, it's just a whole different ball game from what it used to be 20, 30 years ago. We know Absolutely. that your plants need to be safe. And when they're end of life, ship them back to from where they came. And they, they're smaller, so they are shippable. Sounds good to me, Miss Loverine. Thank you so much. It's been a very, very enlightening, enlivening conversation. And I give you sincere thanks. And to our beloved audience, I say fond de Dieu, Howard Wink, Code Green. See you next time. Thank you.